Lecturer in Global Development Politics at the University of York and co-director of the York uh, Interdisciplinary Global Development Center, the IGDC. Uh, together with my colleagues, Professor Ankita Pandey, uh, Sagnik Datta at the Jindal Global University and Nicholas Please at the University of York, I'm really pleased to welcome everyone to the final event of our colloquium on reinventing citizenship among democratic backsliding. Now, the worldwide crisis in democracy is well-documented and scholars have examined this crisis under the rubric of democratic backsliding, authoritarianism and populism, among other terms. The causes of such crises has been widely debated um, what is ignored uh, in these debates are the very real and practical ways in which individuals, organizations, and collectives of people have resisted the challenge uh, to democracy and built solidarities to overcome the divisions that are sowed by authoritarian rulers. And under these circumstances, the reinventions of citizenship are becoming focal points for democratic struggles. In the backdrop to these recent challenges to democracy uh, across the world, new strategies of participation, resistance, new assertions of identities of historically and recently uh, marginalized communities have emerged. Uh, people across the global south and global north navigate precarious contexts of violence, of conflict, um, as well as uh, exclusionary discourses of citizenship. Um, and these processes, of course, only point to the continued importance of citizenship in the everyday life of people, um, as well as on the broader sociological processes. So against this backdrop, we have been really pleased to be able to provide a virtual gathering of activists, practitioners and academics across the world over the last few months who have taken a critical look at citizenship uh, in an interdisciplinary context. Um, the conversations we have hosted have spoken to various aspects of citizenship today and explored how different acts and enactments of citizenship have manifested across time, across multiple sites and scales, as well as through different encounters. Um, we've learned a great deal from the experiences of our speakers of undertaking their own research and activism, and um, we've been really, really pleased. Um, and in that, continuing on that, in that vein, uh, we are therefore really thrilled to be able to conclude uh, this series with four experts, as it were, on democratic contestations. Um, Ajay Gudavarti, uh, Associate Professor of Political Science from Jawaharlal Nehru University in India, uh, is our first, uh, is, is the first among our four panelists, a prolific writer and columnist. He is the author of several books, the most recent of which is India after Modi, Populism and the Right, uh, unless he's got something else which I have not caught up on yet. <laughs> Welcome, Ajay. Um, second uh, panelist uh, that I'm very pleased to introduce is Arzu Osanlu, uh, Professor of Law, Security and Justice, uh, and the Director of the University of Washington and uh, at, at the University of Washington uh, and co-director of the Middle East Center there. Uh, she's the author of, among other things, The Politics of Women's Rights in Iran. Um, and I, I hope I've got that most recent publication right, Arzu. Welcome. Um, the third panelist um, we have is Hosanna Pinheiro Machado, uh, professor at the School of Geography at the University College Dublin, and a principal investigator of a huge European Research Council project on the far right and labor precariousness in the global south. Her many publications uh, include uh, counterfeit itineraries in the global south. Again, Hosanna, apologies if I've not caught up with your latest book, but welcome. Um, and finally, we have uh, Bin Shu, um, a professor, uh, associate professor in sociology at uh, Emory University. Um, again, author of several publications, uh, and the most recent book is The Culture of Democracy. Um, and I hope I've got that right. Uh, welcome, Professor Shu. And uh, welcome everyone and welcome to our audience who are joining us uh, from different geographies and different uh, time zones. 
Um, this uh, uh, today we 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 plan this session as a series of uh, uh, sort of conversations um, in the sense there'll be several rounds, um, and uh, we sort of uh, you know chat for about an hour or a little over an hour, and then we'll open up to question and answers. Um, so if I could. If I may briefly um, invite uh, our panelists to uh, introduce uh, your work um, and understandings, your understandings of the challenges to democracy today, uh, that'll be great. So if I could request uh, perhaps Ajay to, uh, you know, tell us a bit about your work, Ajay, and uh, how you want to understand the challenges to democracy today. Uh, and then I'll go on to uh, Arzu, Hosanna, and Bin. But Ajay, over to you. Well, <clears throat> thanks, Indrajit, for that. Uh, thanks for organizing this much needed uh, global conglomeration on discussing democracy. Uh, so my own work uh, in terms of democracy, as you have uh, pointed out to that book, <clears throat> uh, recent has been along the axis of understanding rise of uh, populist authoritarianism uh, in India. And that I have done through, uh, among many other aspects, uh, what really interested me are two important uh, dimensions to it. One, the uh, interface between neoliberalism and uh, majoritarianism, that how do we explain this growing uh, condition of precarious distress conditions of subsistence living and need-based economy. And as you know, India has had a sustained agrarian crisis, jobless growth, and more recent kind of uh, migrant crisis, uh, we, we seem to observe that the uh, most political parties and elites uh, have kind of insulated themselves from popular pressures. And that has left, you know, the, uh, that has heavily influenced uh, modes of uh, protest and modes of resistance uh, against uh, neoliberal uh, modes of uh, economic uh, growth models. Uh, that's one uh, part that I try to investigate in, in which I try to argue the, uh, I mean, try to investigate this question as to why, uh, in spite of on one hand, there being a certain kind of dealignment uh, with popular uh, protests around economic issues, especially class based uh, kind of voting or mobilization. There has nevertheless been growing uh, voter turnout in India. You know, most, uh, you know, India has perhaps figures in, uh, globally among the top uh, countries in terms of voter turnout uh, year after year, election after election. And interesting, the second dimension to that is that more the voting, there is more uh, pro-corporate governments being voted in. Uh, in spite of the visible anger against growing inequalities and uh, against neoliberalism. So that's my first question as to which we need to get some handle on as to why does, uh, what possibly explains uh, this anomaly. My second, uh, uh, book, my more recent book uh, after the book on populism was an edited volume on uh, titled Secular Sectarianism, uh, Limits of Subaltern Politics. Uh, where I try to, again, look at uh, subaltern responses to uh, populist authoritarianism uh, and this rightward shift in the Indian politics. You know that uh, all recent election data shows that 33% uh, of Dalits and 42% of OBCs have moved to uh, BJP and to the ranks of even the RSS. Uh, so again, uh, social fragmentation, identity, uh, mobilization around difference, uh, uh, is not really a big check on uh, confessional uh, emergence of confessional majority. Uh, and Indrajit, you would know traditional political science, uh, for instance, Rudolphs and Rudolphs uh, have argued for long that caste differences in the Indian uh, context are a check on confessional majority. You might recall Rajni Kothari's writings uh, celebrating OBC reservations as a secular upsurge of bringing Muslims and OBCs together. But secularization of caste and politicization of caste uh, that was often celebrated, even much of post-colonial literature, uh, as a signpost of uh, Indian way of democracy or the idea of our modernity, something that is unique and specific to India. It is the same caste networks uh, that are today infused with uh, Hindu identity. You know, that's again a big question that we need to kind of revisit those traditional formulations to understand uh, what does this mean? It obviously means to some extent that uh, the Indian right has managed to have 
keep uh, caste differences along with an idea of a monolithic Hindu identity. These are not necessarily contradictory in terms, but in fact, you could be a Dalit for the purposes of representation, and you could be a Hindu for the purposes of recognition. So I think there is a lot more in terms of continuity uh, rather than in terms of a binary formulations. So they, those were uh, two of my current uh, engagements and then I have moved on. My forthcoming book is on uh, ethics and emotions where I've tried to argue that we perhaps have to move beyond uh, you know, conventional uh, social categories and protocols to really understand some kind of a, a post-material, quote-unquote post-material phenomenon that is uh, you know, gazing at us in terms of understanding as an entry point to actually re, uh, you know, visit questions of institutions, law, uh, political regimes uh, and so on and so forth. Thanks. Thanks, Ajay. That, that's, I think, a very interesting uh, sort of entry point into uh, getting you to tell us more about reinventions of democracy down the line. So we'll come, come back to you uh, in the second round. Thank you, Ajay. Arzu, if I could invite you to, you know, briefly introduce your work and, uh, you know, how you understand the challenges to democracy today, please. Thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me to this very interesting interesting and um, important panel. Um, you know, I didn't start out as a, you know, academic or scholar. I was actually a lawyer and in the United States, and I was very interested in pursuing sort of um, democratic agendas, if you will, through law. And at the same time, I, as a youth, <laughs> In the United States, I was looking at what was happening in Iran, the country that my family is from, and I was trying to understand um, what was happening in the revolution. And part of the reason for that was um, this idea that, you know, I Iranian women are oppressed, they have no power. And what I remember from the revolutionary period in 1979 was that there were certain promises afforded to women, that is to elevate their status. And um, that this emphasis on women in Iran and their treatment and expectation to um, have more participation, to be treated with dignity and respect was actually of a piece with Ayatollah Khomeini's designation of women's status as a central um, aim in creating this new Islamic government. And so since that period, women had become very important roles, if not tropes for the Islamic government. And they have gained a permanent foothold in the state because their concerns had become part of the broader issues of social justice affecting the entire nation, in fact. And at the same time, in the formation of this, what it became this experiment, this Islamic Republic, um, there were tremendous contests about even the name of this entity. Um, during the transitional phase, um, there was a national referendum in Iran. Um, and as they were planning for it, March, it was March 30 and 31st, 1979, um, they wanted to determine the name of this new polity. And many groups were, you know, who were part of the revolution were actually throwing around names, Democratic Republic of Iran, Democratic Islamic Republic of Iran. And Khomeini, in response to that, said a very famous line, not one word more, Islamic Republic. Not a democratic republic, not a democratic Islamic Republic. Do not use the word democratic. That is the Western style. And so throughout the period that I've been doing research on Iran, maybe for the last um, 20 or so years, I've been trying to understand how the Islamic Republic, with the institutions of a republic and a codified system of law that animates rights and rights talk alongside a revolution that took women and women's issues as a central frame for the revolution, now is treating not just women, but all of its citizens, including religious and ethnic minorities. Um, 
and I, I I'll speak a little bit more. And so that became the first book that you mentioned, um, the politics of women's rights and how discourses around rights and rights talk, whether it's women's rights or human rights, became politicized. Um, but as we move forward to think about challenges, I also became very interested in discourses around charity, humanity, benevolence, which are in some ways, you know, very nice words, um, but they're actually, I would say, starkly opposed to demo democracy and democratic agendas. And um, so that's sort of emerged for me as a challenge. And, and I learned about this in the research for my second book um, called Forgiveness Work, which is really looking at um, anti-death penalty activism, specifically in the context of murder, because in Iran, victims' families have the right to determine whether to ask the state to exact retributive sanctions that is an eye for an eye, or they can forego it. And my question became, well, who would forego retributive sanctioning when they can ask for uh, exact, uh, who would, who would, who would um, go for uh, forgiveness when they can ask the state to exact uh, retributive sanctioning? Um, so I'll say more about that, but that's one of the big challenges, I think, to democratic agendas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I think it, it's very nicely, you know, Ajay mentioned the ethics and you're talking about forgiveness. And I think these are sort of very interesting tropes, if you will, or, you know, themes that one can, I guess, pick up down the line. Uh, thanks. Uh, Hosanna, um, over to you. If you could tell us a bit about, you know, introduce uh, your work a bit and uh, tell us how you understand the challenges to democracy today. Thank you so much, Indrajit. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today in this exciting panel. It's always a pleasure to, to be part of panels with this group of people studying democratic challenges and hope as well. So my, uh, my work, um, my research is about Bolsonaro. I study Bolsonaro supporters in Brazil, especially among um, lower, uh, lower classes, low income groups, including the poor, the very poor, or or, or low-income groups who are living the poverty line. So this is basically what I'm, I've been studying since 2016, when Bolsonaro started emerge as a phenomenon among the poor. I mean, Lula is still very strong and stronger among the poor, but Bolsonaro also became very, very strong as with the populist narrative. And, uh, but also I'm expanding, I'm very interested in, in discussing and expanding this perspective to a global South perspective. And this is something that we can discuss in the second round because um, I, I've been arguing and I know that in Indraj as well and so many colleagues that uh, we've in the Global South we face, we face some issues, especially due to the colonized past that should be properly understood. And also the source of resistance is booming in the South. When you look at the feminist movements in South America, you can see that, uh, wow, we have something there that's, that's going on. And so my work, my academic work is studying, uh, is following Bolsonaro supporters and so hopefully next year I will expand with collaborators to this research to India and the Philippines. But I also act as an activist in Brazil and as an immigrant here in the UK, in the UK, I just moved from the UK <laughs> in Ireland. Um, I, I, now I needed to rely on social networks and social media. And, uh, but I've been working closely with social movements since, I don't know, 20 years ago and uh, trying to support social movement as, as much as I can, but also learning from them and collaborate with them and therefore working as a public intellectual. So on, on the one hand, I'm studying hate and on the other hand, I'm working closely with social movements and trying to regain my, my source of hope. And this is basically my work, my, my latest book, Amanhã Vai Ser Maior, which was 
a book for larger audiences in Brazil. Not this is not an academic book, uh, but this is basically trying to show what happened in Brazilian society since 2013, when big demonstrations took place in Brazil and changed everything, changed changed the course of Brazilian democracy, and then Brazil went through a kind of bifurcation. And uh, we have with the growth of the far right and authoritarian forces uh, in Brazil, as well as the renewal of social movements, and uh, which is very interesting. This con these these two sources and opposing sources of movements in Brazil. So my work is trying to understand why uh, why we elected Bolsonaro, but also always trying to find the the roots. Uh, the way out of this authoritarian momentum. And in the second round, I, I think I can talk more about uh, the challenges for Lula uh, government in Brazil in the next four years. Thank you so much. Thanks, Susanna. I think you're right. There's there's just a lot to think about in terms of you know the, the topics you've identified in terms of mm -hmm. class and hope and the intersections um, to think about how one might renew democracy. Thank you. Um, and Bin, um, if you could, um, you know, briefly introduce your work and, you know, how you came to these questions, these questions and your understandings of the challenges to democracy today, please. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me for this uh, really global um, dialogue. And we, uh, the four of us actually came from uh, different backgrounds, which is very interesting sort of a configuration of you know, different countries and regimes and, and, and also the concerns. I guess uh, one thing that is common to all of us is the threat from authoritarianism, uh, which not only means that if you look at, you know, the, the list of countries in terms of the regime type uh, in, in the world, and you find half of them or at least, you know, at least half of them are authoritarian or hybrid or in any ways, you know, not democratic regimes, but also even under democratic regimes, you find the authoritarian tendencies. Uh, for example, we have India, we have um, Brazil, and even in the United States after 2016, people are talking about authoritarian tendency. I don't want to name individual leaders, but you all know who they are. But you know, this is something that is an awakening moment for me to understand what authoritarianism is, because I came from an authoritarian country, uh, China. Apparently, that's something that out, out there. Um, but you know, when I started my job in the United States, I assumed that the United States it should be a perfect example of a democracy. All of a sudden, 2016 <laughs> is an awakening moment for us to, and also challenged me on you know, more deeper issues about what authoritarianism is, why, what, what's its appealing points to many people. So that's basically the things that sort of drive me to understand lots of challenges that democracy is facing today. And more specifically, I, I think uh, one big question that um, actually is, is common to my work is we how do we understand civil societies under authoritarianism and also its potential for democracy? So in my first book, I talked about civic engagement in China, um, particularly uh, the a very huge wave of volunteering after the Sichuan earthquake in 2008. So I talked to, uh, I did a participant observation and, you know, uh, interviews and talked to the people who rushed to Sichuan after the earthquake with enthusiasm, but, uh, you know, there are political constraints about their volunteering. So I tried to understand how they interpret the meanings of their engagement and what's the political sort of a dilemma and ethical dilemma they are facing in their volunteering. This actually leads to my uh, recent book you just mentioned, The Culture of Democracy, a Sociological Approach to Civil Society, which is more a th theoretical synthesis of the cultural sociology of civil society. So, um, so you probably hear a lot about, you know, civil society, the concept which has been mocked by many people as like the chicken soup for social science. It's it's very um, you know uh, very nice concept which is ideal, but it's useless in terms of analytical uh, analysis, uh, the analytical uh, values. But I try to counter this claim um, to point out that first we need to pay attention to how people think, 
how people understand the meanings of their, their actions and also the interaction norms among them when they're actually engaged in their civil society actions. So in other words, culture is at a central point of a civil society without which we cannot understand civil society, without which we cannot understand democratic potential. So this is a, a part I call the culture of democracy. And on the other hand, I believe that our study of the culture of democracy shouldn't be entirely normative. Instead, it should be based on empirical research. In other words, we need to talk to people, need to study how they think um, about the meanings of their actions. And from that, we can make arguments about the potential of a civil society. So it's a thoroughly empirical research with an emphasis on people's values, ideas, and meanings, and norms of interactions. So I'm currently um, sort of extending this um, book uh, to two projects. One is um, I'm uh, collaborating with my graduate students on how um, the Chinese speaking public sphere debating over the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, so there are lots of surprises in this debate. For example, those pro-democracy people, the political exiles in the United States, many of them are actually against the Black Lives Matter. And you will ask a question, why? <laughs> And another project is about the Chinese uh, state's um, uh, COVID-19 policy and also some responses from the civil society. For example, the recent protests in China, some of you probably follow the news, which actually pushed the state to change its lockdown policy to a more uh, relaxation and also mitigation, sort of that kind of a uh, measures. So that's something I'm working on now, all related to our topic today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bin. I think this this conversation around civil society, um, of course, uh, Hosanna talked about social movements, and uh, there's a lot that can be debated as to, you know, whether these are really as, as apolitical as critics have made them out to be, or, you know, can they really be incubators of these sorts of uh, you know, uh, challenging ideas that you mentioned. And I think that that's really good to think about. And it very nicely leads us into the second round of uh, conversations. If we think about, uh, you know, how could one thing, you know, reflect on uh, reinventing citizenship in order to renew democracy? Uh, you know, what what can one do? What How, how can people, communities, um, reinvent citizenship uh, to to rethink their democracies. So actually, Hosanna, if I could sort of take you on, uh, uh, you know, a bit further, the Brazilian case, of course, suggests that um, the erosion of democracy can be arrested. Um, there's a lot of hope, at least among, uh, and that's a, a term you mentioned, of course, and, uh, you know, we're all big on hope here, I guess, well, some of us at least. Um, you know, you, 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 the Brazilian case could be sort of uh, thought of as, as an example where the erosion of uh, democracy, the backsliding of democracy can be arrested. Um, as uh, as someone who has engaged very closely with uh, Brazil's politics and Brazilian society, um, what opportunities do you see for renewing of democracy based on what one has seen in Brazil? Thanks. This is a very interesting question and a very interesting moment, actually. Lula is about to, uh, to start his administration amongst huge demonstrations against him. Not huge, actually, but uh, very strong and motivated groups occupying military bases in Brazil and asking for a coup. So this is something that we expected and, uh, and Bolsonaro is now, yesterday, we, we came to know something that uh, we are, we knew actually that uh, actually he is supporting these groups and uh, supporting these groups and occupations pro coup, let's say. And, uh, but at the same time, Lula won in a very tight election, very, very tight, 50-50 basically, but um, um, this, this was, this was amazing if you think that Bolsonaro had the whole political machine and the whole political machine, including the, mach the communication machine. And, uh, and now we, we are witnessing something really, really interesting and challenging. And I think this is what we should uh, analyze and trying to understand in the next years and also to intervene. 
is a big Lula is forming a big collision between the democratic right, including democratic right. His vice president is someone from a traditional right in Brazil, but also governing with grassroots social movements. So we 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 saw this in the past in the first Lula mandate, so administration, and we know the challenges of of this. So I think the main challenge today is um, is how to how to work with this large and wide coalition, which actually is, is, is very interesting. And now they are setting up for the first time large um, groups for, for the transition, including people from different backgrounds and many people from grassroots social movements, people, um, experts. So it's really interesting. And, uh, and um, but now we need to see if First, Lula will be able to govern because he doesn't have the majority in the Congress and Senate as well. But he's creating this, this network, which is very diverse and therefore challenging. But uh, it, it's really interesting because something that happened in Brazil, I've been arguing that Brazil experienced one of the most radical experiences of the far right in the world. And, uh, and the Bolsonaro, uh, government. I mean, he's he's a genocide, and uh, he he has acted as a genocide during the pandemic. Or uh, his his policy um, for indigenous people uh, actually no policy at all. And uh, but at the same time that we 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 went through this moment of despair, and uh, we. Uh, the civil society in Brazil was very vibrant. Uh, well, it's not a contradiction, actually, is, is a response to this moment. So some movements that became really strong in Brazil in the last 40 years was pro-science, of course, because of the pandemic. Um, a new type of Black movement coalition, which is a coalition amongst all Black social movements in Brazil, and they became really strong. And you had Marielle Franco in one of the colloquiums, and she is one of the people working with Lula now, maybe one of possible minister of women's affairs. We, know, we don't know there are many people competing for this role, not competing, uh, that are being, uh, that people expect that could occupy this role. But uh, so it's really interesting. And now Lula created the Ministry of Native of a native population of indigenous people, which is something very new and really important for Amazonia as well. And um, so we have these all these new movements, of course, feminist movement, but feminist movement uh, ha has been strong since 2015, very, very strong with leading movements against the Bolsonaro. And uh, uh, actually women were responsible for the election of Lula. So women elected Lula. So we, we have all this interesting picture and now the challenge is to see uh, so the first challenge is how not to institutionalize so grassroots social movements, because we know that this destroys the grassroots component of social movements. And um, the second challenge is to renew the leadership, but uh, in terms of we need new leadership beyond Lula, along with Lula. And um, yes, and also the problem of social movements being tokens which I think is not the case, but this is something that we needed to be alert all the time. But now is a moment for hope, for happiness. I just come back from Brazil, and that's why I'm still sick and with long COVID because it was long days of celebrations. And uh, so it is a moment of hope, and we are witnessing this, all these groups being, transition groups being formed. And with like the best people that we have in Brazil, we know them experts, activists, and the politicians. So now we, we, the only option we have is to hope and to, and to do everything we can as scholars, as activists, as citizens to, uh, to help and support Lula government because it's going to be challenging with uh, considering that Bolsonaro still have 50% of the voters. Thanks, thanks, Susana. I think it's a really, um, 
sort of interesting point about social movements and their institutionalization or, or or as you put it, what institutionalization does to social movements and therefore to prevent it, as 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 I think you 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 mentioned. Um, and that's definitely one way to think about, you know, how you might, um, you, you know, arrest uh, the erosion of democracy or renew democracy, uh, as it were. And I think that's 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 really uh, things to think about further. Um, thank you so much, uh, Hosanna. Um, Arzu, if I could put the same question to you, um, uh, especially given the protests in Iran uh, that uh, the world has been watching. Um, how do you think one might, uh, you know, uh, reflect on renewing democracy? And especially if, if, if I could sort of, you know, get you to tell us how salient you see the protests in Iran to uh, the renewal of democracy, either in Iran or worldwide. Yes, um, thank you so much for this question. And, um, you know, I do think that we can look at Iran the current protests in Iran as a case study for reinventing citizenship and promoting, <clears throat> excuse me, democratic renewal. Um, so as I just said a few minutes ago, during the revolutionary era, leaders spoke about elevating women's status. And as you know, in the protests, women are at the forefront. Um, there, these are women's issues. It started with the women's issues, but it's now much broader about uh, civil and political liberties, economic uh, liberties. Um, and so I, I want to bring you back, if you will, um, when just after the revolution, and that this is when I was um, starting to get interested um, in the situation of the women in Iran, because um, much of the scholarship that was coming out um, noted that women had no rights or they lost their rights. But even back then, people noticed that this was empirically not in line with women's lives in Iran. Um, and so I was very interested in understanding this misalignment. Um, later, people started saying, no, no, you know, seeing women in civil society, in the public, they said, no, no, women do have rights, but they're being constructed through Islam. So when I first went to Iran um, in 1999, I went kind of armed with this scholarly um, backdrop as a graduate student having done all this reading. And I, I um, was interested in legal issues. So the first thing I did was to start doing research and field work in the office of a very well-known lawyer. Um, and this woman had been practicing law for, at that time, over 30 years. So she was a lawyer before the revolution and continued after. And so when I went to her office to sort of ask permission to do my field work there, she said, I said to her, you know, I'm interested in how women in Iran are seeking their rights through Islam. And I mean, this was kind of the arc of the scholarly literature at the time. And this lawyer just looked at me and said, I, I can't help you here. We have civil codes and civil courts. This is a law office and I'm a lawyer. I don't deal in Islam, I deal in law. And then she went on and said, if you wanna understand women's rights, you have to go to the courts and see for yourself how women are getting their rights. Now, of course, I was very surprised by this response that told me it was civil law and procedure and not these sort of generalized platitudes about respect for women through which women were seeking redress for grievances. So it was this attention to legal process that became very important for me to understand, um, not just what it reveals about, you know, how people resolve their disputes, but also the politics of rights and the operations of power and gender relations. Um, and especially subject formation in Iran. And I promise this is getting to the question about democratic renewal. Um, so we know that in the 1979 revolution, leaders sought to challenge um, sort of Iran's emulation of Western societies and aimed you know, to turn the country towards some authentic cultural values. Um, so, when many groups came together to overthrow the monarchy, 
they established a representative government through what ultimately came through and is came to be an Islamic Republic. And it was this compromise, the marriage of Islamic principles with the sort of institutional framework and procedures of republicanism with a small r, that created the effects that we continue to see today. And like I said, among those effects was the politicization of rights talk by state and non-state actors. And by, by um, politicization, what I'm talking about is this critique of the language of rights made by many actors at the time that spoke about the ills of Western individualism, and how in Iran, the basis of a healthy and moral civil society would be the family. And women, as its crowning jewel, would be the focus. So individuals' rights or needs were to yield to the greater concerns of society. And so rights talk became a verbal index for this sort of sense of entitlement without responsibility. Um, like I said, thought to be the, much of the source of ills in Western societies. Um, but at the same time, as I said, there was this promise to improve women's status. And what was interesting was that the way in which women were able to improve their status was by going to family court, going to court, and in order for them to go to court, they really needed to have a sense of what their legal rights were, not the rights of Islam, but actually how to file a complaint, very practical elements of law. And so the significance of making these claims today that they want their rights is very, um, uh, important to understand because when after the revolution when Khomeini called for an Islamic government he actually said we have no use for a lawmaking body so there was no need for so-called a legislative body that had man-made laws because God's law would determine everything and so Khomeini also dissolved the courts and the civil code but in this period in the 80s, there was so much chaos and unequal um, sort of uh, application of Islamic principles by unqualified clerics that they went back to creating a legislative branch and civil courts as the venue. And they put the laws back in civil codes. And this had the effect of Islam sort of legitimizing the courts, the codes, and the legislative body. So you have this legal blending. And for the first time, we saw this conventional symmetry between Sharia, Islamic principles, and state administered law now blended. And Sharia principles actually were codified. And because they were codified, women like this lawyer I talked to had to learn how to use legal procedures and go into courts and employ a rights-based understanding of their status, precisely what the revolution had cautioned against. So you see the folding of Islamic principles into civil codes and civil courts actually had the opposite effect that Khomeini and the uh, ulama or the members of the Islamic community had, had in mind. They actually, the Republican state framework produced and sort of authenticated in their own terms, liberal subjects. And even if Islamic Republic made women the grounds on which these political disputes over sovereignty were fought, the effect was conspicuously forms of liberalism through the nation state form of a republic. And today, these institutions comprise the tangible 
apparatus of everyday life. And they shape the sensibilities, the affect, the subjectivity, and ultimately the practice of people in the everyday. And so, you know, I think it was this unintended result of this legal blending that led many decades ago to women lawyers like the one I met who said, you know, we have civil law and civil codes and I go to court and fight for the rights of my clients, even though Khomeini said, no, we don't need, you know, the words democracy. And they've actually unwittingly produced people with expectations of democratic values. Thanks. I think that's really interesting, you know, to think about, um, I think you you use the word blending, the way in which different um, ways of thinking about institutions, as it were, different institutional practices were really uh, blended together and often in contradiction with each other. So um, you might almost say that, uh, you know, a dem democratic renewal could come from within institutional contradictions or Unintended, of course, as you put it, but you know there are institutional contradictions, and from within those spaces, you have uh, some sort of um, ideas about renewing democracy, um, and of course, creation of subjectivities that might sort of push for that. And I think that's a very interesting conversation to have with, uh, you know, how these might sit with social movements, and you know, the, the, the ways in which they might actually support social movements, but also uh, try and tame them. And it's it's that kind of um, the agonism between the two really that that's that's fascinating um bin if i could uh, you know pull you into this conversation really thinking about openings for democracy uh, based on your expertise of china but also the book the broader book you've written on the culture of democracy and um what kinds of movements do you think or what kinds of blends uh, now that you know we are sort of thinking about uh, ways in which different uh, uh, trends intersect um what kinds of trajectories might nudge uh, countries or societies towards, uh, you know, more uh, openness and participation. Yeah, it, it's great to hear um, Arzu and Hosanna um, talking about lots of things what, which I can find in China as well and also in this global world as well. One particular point uh, I feel um, very interested in their, you know, um, insightful comments is the role of women. Uh, in pushing forward democracy and also uh, building civil society. So in the recent protests in China, some of you, I assume, uh, have already followed the protests, not just against the lockdown, but also against the regime. And the young women are on the uh, forefront, and they are the ones that are holding the white paper. Uh, you know, it's basically a silent protest and a resistance to the censorship, to the you know, the surveillance and I'm saying nothing, but this saying nothing and white paper is the most effective resistance to this censorship, right? So the people who are in front of the lines of a protest are all women and they got arrested. They are very brave, but behind these women, we need to see a successful or a partially successful mo movement in China that is the feminist movement. So if you look at the the past 10 years, most of the social movements in China were dormant, that's true. But one movement that is has been developing in a quiet way that is the feminist movement. Uh, in, in culture, in, even in popular culture, you have a lot of talk shows, uh, stand-up comedies um, by women. And also um, the uh, feminist activists got into debates with other people, with the government, of course, they got into trouble with the government as well. They were arrested. But the gender equality and all these um, issues, the brave woman should lead the trend of social changes. These ideas have been spread among the people. This is something that is beyond the headlines of the newspapers. So I was not very surprised by the role of young women. This is also a sort of point for us to think about what do we mean by democracy? And what do we mean actually by civil society? So if you sort of limit democracy to um, a system of the state electoral system, you know, the checks and balances of uh, between different divisions of power and rule of law, we only see despair in China, right? In the past 10 years, 
with this, uh, the current leader, Xi Jinping, uh, we see a clear tendency to become more totalitarian than authoritarian. You know, the civil society, the formal organizations were suppressed and the power gradually concentrated on one person, that's him, he himself. And so this is basically despair and we probably don't see democracy in China's uh, system as well. But if we expand the concept uh, of democracy from regime type to a concept closer to what John Dewey says is democratic social life, and not just the, you know, the system, but also a mode of association. So that will expand our scope to think about democracy. And in other words, from my point of view is that democracy is not just about a system, but also about a demo democratic social life. So if we start from this point, we can make an argument, even on the authoritarianism, there is a tendency to become more democratic for the social life. And also the flip side of this, even under a consolidated democracy, and we will see the erosion of democratic social life uh, in those countries, for example, you know, the countries we're talking about today and also in the United States as well. So this is a starting point. We need to look at um, many things. Um, and I agree with uh, Hasana's uh, fantastic comment about despair and hope. We see hope in despair. Um, so or in in the words of uh, Václav Havel, and that's, you know, the power of the powerlessness, right? So you can see the people um, in China today are changing so fast that the regime cannot catch up with. So the regime actually doesn't really understand what the society is. So for example, you have th this movement, this uh, protest uh, is very global. Uh, you see a lot of students in uh, major universities, campuses in the United States, in Europe, they protested against, um, uh, against the regime. So including my own university, I have participated in one of the, uh, the vigil slash uh, protest and students gather together. There's sort of a very multi-vocal expressions. You have uh, pure anti-lockdown slogans. And you have slogans against the CCP, against the President Xi. And also you have slogans for wayward people, the ethnic minority in Xinjiang, all kinds of expressions are there, but they're very young college students, young urban professional. I was probably the oldest one there. So they were like, you know, what are you doing here, old man? But, you know, anyway, so you see this wave of global um, sort of protests, which supplies the regime as well. And also there's a resonance between the overseas Chinese and the domestic Chinese um, because of the internet censorship. People sent videos and pictures to some accounts on Twitter. And then the Twitter accounts become hubs for spreading and diffusing all these videos and and, and pictures, which were sent back to China and to uh, those people in China, and they spread the pictures and the videos. So this global feature is very impressive. Another thing is that the younger generation has a very clear consciousness and articulation of some basic values of democracy, such as freedom. And freedom becomes really concrete today because if you cannot get outside a building or residential area, you basically have no way to get your food and your livelihood you know, got harmed by this very draconian uh, lockdown policy. So freedom is not an empty word anymore, it's very concrete. And people suddenly realize freedom is relevant to our life. And also such as inclusive, you see all these multivocal expressions in the protests. And also solidarity. Um, in some places, particularly in the United States, the Han Chinese, the majority, uh, ethnic majority, Han Chinese people said, we need to apologize to the waivers. And because we didn't pay attention to their suffering before this, now we are experiencing the same thing. They have been suffering so much in the past decades. Now we have realized that, you know, we are all in, in the same boat. So this kind of solidarity with the ethnic minorities is something that is um, so articulated in this wave of protests. And also more um, generally, I think there's a moment of awakening for the younger generation. Uh, for example, uh, you probably heard a lot of the things about the younger generation being nationalistic, being red, 
and being pro um, CCP. That was true. So some of my you know younger relatives on my social media always look at me like this guy was so radical, and then now they are even more radical than me. Um, so they realize that the you know it's it's not you know the policy itself, but the regime. Um, their suppression of freedom of speech, suppression of uh, public debates over uh, public health policies, and, and their you know uh, not just the mistakes, some of the ignorance of basic human rights is are the problem are the where the problems are. So I want to say that um, you know this is a very interesting way for us to think about you know what democracy is under authoritarianism. If we only focus on the outcome of social movement activism and civil society in terms of a regime change or other big structural changes, we're probably in a state of despair. And we probably won't see regime change in the next 10 years in China. But if we shift our focus from only regime change to society itself and to understand democracy, not only as a uh, regime type, but also as a uh, democratic social life, we see lots of people are making efforts to build this democratic social life, and they're also changing um, the societies on the authoritarianism. So that was a very interesting uh, way to sort of uh, to speak to the theme today that reinventing citizenship and the context now is in China and other authoritarian um, uh, countries such as Iran, you know, it's 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 happening. Things are happening now in a very encouraging way. So th we see that um, uh, in, in other contexts as well. Thank you, thank you, Ben. I think it's it's really fascinating to talk to think about democracy as association because, um, and and the the ways in which you you might have popular movements even if these structures themselves are well authoritarian. And of course, China's regime is uh, you know famously. Uh, they they call it uh, you know uh, example of authoritarian resilience etc. Uh, but underneath that there are these sorts of trends as you put it these tendencies as you put it which uh, uh, I think uh, cannot be ignored or can only be ignored at one's own peril. You know you 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 sort of try to box countries on the basis of their regimes but don't pay attention to what's going on in society. You know it's these kinds of uh, dichotomies that will be we'll, we'll, conceptual dichotomies that we end up with which are not really helpful i was also quite struck with uh, you know the way in which uh, the the idea of solidarity was invoked uh, and you know the the examples of uh, you know uh, han chinese apologizing to the uyghurs for ignoring and neglecting their uh, predicament I, obviously you know has lessons for uh, you know for all of us um, so i think that's 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 a really uh, useful way to think about renewing democracy, not only in terms of bringing about a new regime or a different regime, or insisting that elections are more robust and free and fair. That's important, I'm sure, but it's also about the sorts of connections and uh, solidarities that you build up. Thank you. Thank you for those um, insights. Um, finally, Ajay, if I could sort of, uh, you know, bring you into this conversation and, you, you know, tell us a bit about how you reckon we might be thinking about renewing democracy? And, and are there any trends from India that you think might offer lessons, either for renewing democracy or what not to do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, no, I think the uh, situation in India does resonate with what some of my co-panelists have mentioned, but it's also quite different. As you know, in the, we have had a series of uh, protest movements. We have had India witnessed uh, two years of a uh, robust uh, farmers protest uh, we have followed up by shaheen bag we had protests against uh, ca and nrc citizenship act uh, we have had student uh, uh, protest politics uh, uh, active uh, in india therefore in that sense we have had uh, a series of protests which i think did bring up uh, newer questions uh, on board i mean which uh, uh, no resonates with uh, a quick example that comes to my mind that resonates with what bin uh, emphasized in the Chinese context was the farmers uh, in India apologizing to the Muslims for the Muzaffar Nagar riots and also including bringing Dalits on board uh, during the uh, in, in their own uh, Ka Panchayats. Uh, I think those kinds of new solid that emphasis on solidarity. Uh, I think that's a very uh, distinct. It, it, it clearly resonates globally. But uh, you no know, domination can be structural. 
but democracy has to be lived. So we need to really think of uh, everyday ethics, uh, everyday practices. Uh, 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 and therefore, I think India is also at the cusp of looking at uh, uh, addressing newer questions of how to reinvent uh, citizenship. It definitely cannot uh, be a repetition of the old uh, politics of accommodation model of the Congress uh, kind. Uh, and therefore, in that sense, I, I have always felt that this populism at its core uh, does, I think, carry uh, a, a sentiment of social democratization, that it is the bottom up social democratization that is knocking and has taken this form. Uh, it is strange that it has taken authoritarian form, but there are historical reasons, I think, globally and Indian case as to why uh, we are witnessing uh, this mode of uh, articulation of uh, uh, 30, 40 years of uh, social democratization in India, especially I think the variation between uh, a certain kind of social democratization that has come about in the Indian case across caste uh, and gender and uh, on regional linguistic uh, grounds, but there is growing economic inequality. I think that variation is what I read it as uh, the source for rise of uh, uh, this authoritarian form in the Indian context. But the recent protest movements have also been uh, limited and I've myself written on uh, you know, this protest movements as to why their reach has been somewhat limited, you know, uh, whether it's farmers movement, whether it is the Shaheen Bagh uh, protest politics and also the uh, uh, students protest politics. I think among all the case studies that we are really looking at, I think I get a sense that Indian authoritarian, uh, you no know, populist authoritarianism is deeply rooted in its uh, uh, cultural practices. I think it has taken a distinct uh, form of articulating uh, idea of civil solidarity, that it is inclusive, it has a sense of, uh, you know, uh, a great continuity of Indic heritage, there's a civilizational discourse, uh, there's, a, there's a kind of an inclusive sense of uh, 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 Hinduism and uh, uh, the way religious articulation is happening through, let's say, RSS idea of uh, Samrasta. Uh, I think there is that 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 this fact that the strength of this regime really is in terms of its uh, one cultural that it is grounded in cultural structures. It's a populist everyday articulation of some kind of a collective subconscious, you know, which which has some kind of civilizational the kinds of. Uh, a symbolism that the current regime is using, uh, which also I think breaches uh, the political space through a very distinctly non-political uh, uh, everyday language and ethic, you know, in terms of bringing in questions of spirituality, uh, bringing in questions of intimacy, uh, bringing in questions of uh, everyday cultural practices, you know, the symbolism of uh, the slogan like Desh Chalana Hai Sarkar Nahi, uh, Prime Minister talking about seva, which is broadly service, uh, himself depicting himself representing as a fakir or as a pradhan seva. I think these are very deep, uh, uh, deep symbolism that I think in socially differentiated modern complex societies, uh, generating shared meaning uh, is a very complex business. And therefore, it, it, it will invariably be accompanied by certain kind of performance and uh, narrativization. And we need to take those dimensions of uh, uh, political mobilization seriously. So therefore, I think uh, the three questions I would quickly point to that are at the core of uh, 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 that, that we need to really debate in terms of reinventing citizenship is, I think this endemic gap that we have had between legal institutional language on one hand and cultural uh, ethos on the other. I think both liberal scholarship in Indian context, social activists, uh, social movements, secular political articulations, and post-colonial indigenous local variations, I think have made a binary between the cultural and the constitutional, uh, somewhat like a debate between Gandhi and Ambedkar in the Indian context. I think today we are, uh, we are increasingly public debates in India are realizing that unless we don't ground a legal rationality uh, in terms of its uh, cultural grounding, uh, then its reach would be limited. That this constitutionalism or constitutional morality, civic associationalism uh, has to fuse with uh, cultural symbolism to kind of appropriate and produce uh, uh, newer notions of civil solidarity. And that solidarity has to be stronger. So in that sense, it, this populism 
uh, really is pushing us towards uh, thinking in terms of newer ways beyond uh, given identity politics, beyond sectoral mobilizations. Uh, I think it has pushed a bottom up uh, logic in terms of giving representations to subcasts within Dalit, subcasts within OBCs, bringing in question of gender within Muslims, uh, question of Pasmanda Muslims. Uh, I think all those questions that ideal secular left progressive politics should have raised uh, in a very strange way, it is the conservative right that is uh, you know, pointing to these, these, these inconsistencies within the secular progressive politics. So I think Going back, there is no point, there is no way we can return back to old kind of uh, constitutional formulations. There is no way of going back to the old kind of Congress kind of centrism of politics of accommodation that happened mostly through uh, regional and sub elites. Uh, in that sense, there is a democratic push and uh, the newer versions of reinventing citizenship will have to take these questions. And in that, there is no other way in other than articulating through our stronger notions of solidarity. What that stronger notion of solidarity would be, what social form would that take, uh, I think is something that we, we need to really debate. Uh, you might have followed Indrajit the recent Pew Research uh, Foundation's recent survey on India, uh, on uh, notions of tolerance in the Indian context. It came up with very fascinating uh, you know, uh, observations, which it in fact formulates it as most Indians believe in an abstract way they value diversity, but in the concrete every day they wish to have more segregated kind of living. So it points to it as living together separately, uh, that people feel uh, for democracy diversity is important, but uh, they wish to preserve their own cultural specificities, cultural identities, habitations, exclusive neighborhoods, so on and so forth. Uh, this abstract celebration of diversity versus concrete segregation, I think really points to uh, the kind of anomalous situation that India has. Uh, and therefore, the newer forms will have to debate solidarity and uh, Ambedkar's emphasis on fraternity, not merely as an abstract ideal, as not merely as a normative goal, uh, but it has to be in terms of its lived concrete social form. What forms uh, would that take? At the second level, I point out that reinvention of uh, uh, citizenship would mean in the Indian context, what I would refer to as a third democratic upsurge. Now we have had the first democratic upsurge against the colonial rule. We had the second democratic upsurge in 1990s with the introduction of the backward class reservations. I think what really India is awaits is a third democratic upsurge that would talk about uh, a cross caste, cross class solidarities. Uh, that it has to move beyond those sectoral identity versions in terms of its sequestered kind of existence. And therefore, I think we need a new kind of, you know, in cultural sociology, Jeffrey Alexander's words, a new kind of a civil sphere, uh, which I think, I think this new Congress protest, Bharat Jodo, again, in a very abstract, vague sense is trying to articulate, but I think that has to be accompanied by more concrete notions of uh, social democracy, more concrete notions of uh, structural welfareism. I think one big uh, question I feel that would really push, uh, give a uh, no hard push to this is uh, quality education, that free uh, neighborhood schooling system, uh, free and quality education for all. I think the demands of this kind uh, would give a big push to uh, reinventing citizenship uh, in the modern context. Therefore, I think the big uh, takeaways would be that uh, populism does represent a certain sentiment of social democratization. It's not all about authoritarianism. Authoritarianism is, I think, becomes a red herring if we do not listen to the sensibilities on the ground that they're able to push, but they don't have those requisite avenues to push because constitutionalism, old secularism are failing to articulate this new sensibility. I think they have come in the context of a certain humongous gap between the social elites and the rest. Uh, therefore, they are failing to really articulate these social demands. And therefore, we'll have to listen to those uh, micro foundations of power relations being articulated. And that would come about in terms of fusing local cultural idiom with the institutional language. And second, in terms of large scale structural welfareism that can really build the social form for new kinds of solidarities. 
Thanks. Thanks, Ajay. I think that's, uh, I was struck when you talked about living together separately, it, 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 you know, directly speaks to Bin's point. It's almost like democracy by disassociation or <laughs> democracy as disassociation. You know, you're quite happy with democracy, but not association. But I think the broader sort of lessons in terms of thinking about solidarities remains and thinking about new forms of subjectivities, new kinds of reaching out and reaching uh, caste and class barriers is something that um, one could learn from, I guess. Okay, um, well, thank you for this. I think these are there are lots of cross uh, crossovers in terms of thinking about concepts and thinking about uh, empirical strategies. Um, and as as we enter this the, the final round, so to speak, I wondered if I could invite our panelists to you know share any thoughts you have on emerging research agendas. Um, Arzu, if you had any final words by way of emerging research agendas that you think are, you know, relevant, please. Oh, yes. Thank you so much. I don't want to take a lot of time. So I just want to say, um, you know, we're talking today about Brazil, Iran, India, and China. And I don't want to elude ourselves, those of us who are in US or in the UK or in Europe, that these are issues that are just um, being dealt with in global south contexts, or as, as, as was just said earlier, these authoritarian contexts. Um, we need to understand sort of the institutions and the policies along with um, exactly, I think, what you just said earlier, AJ, what, which was this idea of what are the cultures on the ground that actually are, are being um, inflected through the rule of law, political participation, the discursive qualities of constitutional statehood, because even Iran has a constitution. And, um, you know, the story of, I started with, with Khomeini and returning to Iran and everything, um, people refer to this as an authoritarian populism, which embodies a kind of structural instrumentalism for political expediency, but also alongside a kind of symbolic utopianism. On the one hand, there was like this zealous quest for utopia, and at the same time, a pragmatic struggle for a political order. And these, um, one scholar called them contending authorities. And of course, if we look at Iran and we see that the challenges that the protesters are, are mounting is not just against Islam or Islamic government. It is also for those people who are saying, where are our rights and the rule of law and our political participation? They're also making claims to um, materialist uh, concerns of common people. Um, because, well, I, I won't go into it, but this there is a kind of facile argument that some people like to make that this is just, you know, something weird, exotic over there, Islam. But what I learned in the second project that I talked about, the forgiveness project, is that these values, these ideas um, that are being cultivated for you know being more forgiving they they sound you know excellent but they're also um part of sort of social practices that valorize charity benevolence aid and these systems are sets of relations that are premised on hierarchy and inequality um and they actually expand, increase inequality. So like I said, it's easy to look at uh, a country like Iran and say, oh yes, you know, they want, uh, authoritarian leaders want benevolent subjects or they wanna be benevolent to their docile subjects. But we have to look at, if we look at sort of the, the broader global economy and think about how moral economies of benevolence actually circulate be beyond these uh, zones of authoritarianism and, and look at, for instance, um, the forced migrant issues, right? We're sit standing on top of the worst ever uh, ish forced migrant um, populations of over 110 million. 
And this discourse of humanitarianism that is so popular is itself something that is based on charity and benevolence and not what the activists in Iran or in India or elsewhere are, are calling for, which is less inequality and greater economic redistribution. So I just, I think my, um, you know, further research is to think about the tension um, in terms of our appeals to benevolence and charity and aid in the humanitarian context and how they actually mirror appeals to authoritarian logics. But we don't necessarily notice them because those are in those, you know, backward and exotic countries like, you know, Iran and not in our wider democracy. I hope that made sense. Absolutely. I think uh, there is that conversation to be had uh, without it being hijacked by northern sort of uh, contexts and concerns. Absolutely. I think we're completely on board. Thank you so much, Arzu. I think that's a very useful way to think about what next and what further one can really think about. Ajay, were there any final words, any any quick sort of thoughts you had on further areas of research? Quickly, though, because we are running out of time. Yeah, so I would have point to three uh, quick uh, points uh, in the jet that one is the uh, my own research I'm trying to engage at the interface between uh, critical theory and uh, cultural sociology you know the old kind of uh, crit contemporary critical theory debates of Nancy Fraser Axel Honoth putting them with uh, cultural sociology of uh, Jeffrey Alexander and others uh, where you we, we are raising uh, fascinatingly new questions that how do you fuse uh, normative concerns uh, with understanding the process for what it is on the ground. Uh, therefore, uh, how do you bring culture, everyday culture structures uh, with a certain sense of directionality, certain sense of normative preferences? I think there are some fascinating debates uh, as a good entry point to this. So that would be my first uh, future research that I would be interested in. Second, I think there is a great exposition in terms of emotion studies that have come about in terms of studying everyday emotions, fear, anxiety, uh, hope, uh, no, uh, question of shame, uh, guilt, and all this. I know. I think that uh, the current regime has really, uh, you know, pushed us on the back foot. Really, in terms of mobilizing this the, and showing the effectiveness of the affective dimension. Therefore, the affective logic that instead of you know juxtaposing emotion and reason, uh, we need to move to newer versions of intuitive reasoning or emotional reasoning. I think that would be my second notion of how one can understand the workings of uh, larger notions of civil solidarity have to be understood in terms of these emotions. Third, I think we need to really move beyond uh, post-colonial uh, thought processes. You know, this drawing of difference between East and West, uh, I think uh, North and South, even for that matter, I think no longer seem to uh, really address the kind of newer complexities that we find in terms of uh, the the the, uh, you know, the differentiation within, let's say, global south. Like China presents a uh, you know, interesting case in terms of being located, hyphenated between north and south. Uh, I think the question of internal power relations within southern, uh, with uh, you know, uh, questioning the hegemony of or question of imperialism, uh, imperialism of categories from the north. I think again pushes us to think in your directions in terms of uh, uh, a larger uh, global studies rather than the old kind of post-colonial uh, you know, east versus west kind of frame. So those I think three would be my areas that I would really be interested in. Thanks Ajay, thank you. Bin, if I could invite you to reflect on any thoughts in terms of further research areas, please. Yeah, I don't have specific topics on my mind, but uh, I would say I agree with Arzu and, and also Ajay, in particular Ajay, I would say that uh, as a fellow cultural sociologist, uh, civil society, and also sympathetic with uh, Alexander's uh, civil uh, sphere theory, which is a big part of my book as well, I would call for a, a uh, an explicit attention to culture and practices on the ground at a local level, pay a lot of attention to nuances instead of just following headlines of newspapers and to have like stereotypical uh, impression of any society. Uh, for example, I received a lot of uh, media reviews, uh, interviews recently because of China's 
uh, protests, they ask pretty much the same set of questions, <laughs> whether this can lead to regime change and stuff like that. I would say um, better research agenda need to um, focus Um, I think we've lost you. I, is it just me or can the others? No, no. I, I don't have them. I, uh... Yeah. Ben, I'm sorry. I think we've lost you, um, which is a shame because it was a point that was very much in line with, I think, what everyone was saying. But I'm glad there were resonances with Ajay's work as well as with the point about, you know, not drawing these... Uh, distinctions between north and south too much um okay yes uh ben you're back yeah okay sorry, sorry uh, we missed the last bit so if you just wanted to repeat uh, okay. the last couple of sentences okay uh, basically it's just to um, say like we need to uh, look at more accumulative and gradual uh, process that are going on in any society, not only like the societies on the authoritarianism, but also on the democracy as well. And to focus on how they will lead to changes before these changes actually happen. So in other words, to go beyond um, the sensation, media sensations and to look at um, you know more everyday form, how people talk to each other, what are the values they express in their, in their uh, you know, conversations, uh, in, in formal settings, and so on and so forth. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thanks. I think that's, that's quite valuable in terms of thinking about what sorts of further research would be welcome, I guess, in, in, that breaks this dichotomy between authoritarianism and democracy uh, as systems. Um, um, Hosanna, last word. What areas of further research do you think are would be valuable to take this conversation further? Well, this is a challenging question. I always have many ideas. <laughs> so I have many ideas for future research. So, but I'm going to start um, following being the idea of doing work on the ground. I'm an ethnographer, so I've been doing ethnography for 22 years professionally now. And ever since that, uh, people sometimes say that uh, anthropologists or whoever, they can anticipate some social pro process. And this is not because we are anthropologists, it's just because things are going on on the ground. And I totally agree with uh, being sentenced when he said the regime cannot catch up what's going on. So, because, but uh, research on the ground or activism, whatever, can catch up and can see what's going on on the ground. So, uh, I totally agree on the role, on the importance of doing research and listening to people. This is a principle for me. And, uh, and uh, we, people who were doing field work, uh, maybe eight years ago on politics or never day politics, we know that Bolsonaro would or could win and not because we are smart, but because we are there and we, we could see people like raising these issues. And, uh, and the same thing uh, should be said about the new social movements and all these sources of hopes and uh, creative arrange new arrangements that we have in society that prevent us from despair. So both things are going on and you should I, we should look at these issues uh, on the ground. I mean, I don't think that ethnography or on the ground or any type of research is better than, than others. Just think that this is really important for what we are discussing now in terms of renewal, because uh, about when we talk, when we say that we need to renew democracy, we don't need to reinvent anything or invent anything. For, things are going on already. So, and also in terms, I uh, really like the, the comment about emotions and uh, about anxiety and resentment about the importance of studying emotions and this is something that's uh, only st just being on the ground. And um, also think that we, we tend to focus on negative emotions that populists always try to co-opt but we also should understand the aspiration of people. And then this is both in terms of social movements, both left and right. And finally, I just, I didn't say, I didn't mean that we need to study just the global South. 
the only problem is that uh, we tend to study. I mean, I have here all the handbooks of the far right, and they have the Brazil and India and Philippines as a case study, and the whole theory is always following the same colonial colonial structure, and uh, we are repeating something that we are uh, contesting. So what, what actually what we need more is international uh, practice and inter international collaboration. This panel is amazing and uh, this type of practice and collaboration that we need. Uh, but I still stress the role of understanding the global south. Uh, we have many studies comparing Trump and Bolsonaro, Brexit, Trump and Bolsonaro and India and more. Uh, but we also, uh, uh, I, I really believe in the importance of understanding the impacts of colonialism and how this, this combination of far right with a colonial past has really strong impacts. And, and we needed to understand more each other uh, because uh, from, from this colonial perspective, but this is one perspective, but usually this perspective is overlooked. So this is just one point that we should look at. So yeah, these are my points, and um, yeah, but I could I could I could talk for many hours here with many ideas. Yeah. But we'll we'll hopefully get together in person at some point, and you know we'll get you Hosanna to really talk launch for hours. But no, this is I think it's really helpful to think about this global sort of circulation of ideas and exchange of. Uh, you know, as, as I think people have put it, practice, you know, the sorts of practices that have been, uh, you know, used either by authoritarians or against them. And, you know, how these sort of really how how th there's this cross learning uh, across uh, cultures that's, uh, you know, fed into some of these conversations. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so very much. Uh, that brings us to the end of the conversations uh, as such. So I'm I'm very grateful to all of you for your insights. Um, we have uh, some questions from the audience that has that have come in, um, and if if I have your permission, we could sort of you know you, you know think about some of those uh, you know themes that have been raised, uh, and uh, any of you may want to respond. But there is one question specifically for Arzu, I think, which is uh, to do with uh, you know the significance of the abolition of the moral police in terms of its consequence to civil society voices. Um, what is your what are your thoughts? So maybe Arzu, if you could respond to that, and then we could take the other questions uh, together. Over to you, Arzu. Uh, thank you so much. I just want to um, sadly correct the speaker. There was no abolition of the guidance patrol or morality police. In fact, this was a um, poorly reported in the English press, not in the Persian speaking press. Um, this was the, um, uh, the, the country's sort of pro top prosecutor saying that um, the, the guidance patrol is over, you know, kind of in that, that context. But the guidance patrol or morality police is actually a unit within the police, the broader police forces, which is housed in the interior ministry, not in the judiciary. And the person who was speaking is part of the judiciary. Um, I think there's a little bit of hopeful thinking. I think this person is, I've, I've read reports that the person who made that statement is himself against the morality police, um, even though he supports mandatory headscarves. And also the moral, this, this guidance patrol has only existed since 2005, but there have since the time of the revolution been different kinds of forces, paramilitary forces and competing forces like the Basij that do go around and police civilians. Um, and there's, I can say more, I don't wanna take up all the time, but just, um, I, I wish it, it were the case, it, if it were the case, it, at this point, it would be too little too late anyway. Um, we need to start with a, a real negotiation, at least that's what I'm hearing, about structural changes, not just superficial ones. Thanks. Thank you, Arzu. Um, that leads, I mean, the question at least, even though it, you know, the, the sort of the impetus of the question leads very nicely to the, um, you know, comments that have also been made about the role of women and the ways in which issues of women may or may not be addressed. And 
what might be the ways in which they find resonance. Um, and there is a question along which, uh, you know, talks about um, women being given access to leadership uh, with everything, including state religions. And uh, th th this comment relates also to the UK and to the West. So it is a globally framed sort of comment. I don't know if anyone had any thoughts on the way in which women's uh, interests and women's rights might sort of, you know, demands for those might be a, a way of deepening democracy or renewing democracy. Um, I don't know if anyone, if any of our speakers wanted to come in. Yes, please go for it. I, I don't want to do all the talking and I'm actually going to point to some of my co-panelists here. Um, when the protests in Iran first started, um, a friend of mine actually who's Brazilian living in Brazil said to me, and this is just before Lula was elected, this is a, a movement, a global movement against patriarchy. And I think what's important in all of our, our works, and everyone mentioned this, is we need to understand the conditions of possibility in the context where we are doing research to understand what rights movements look like, what anti-capitalist, anti-patriarchy, whatever movements look like. And it, what we see in Iran is the result of the conditions of possibility. I, I won't, I can say more later what that means, but maybe some of the other speakers can speak about, um, especially uh, Hosanna, about anti-patriarchy. Hosanna, yes, if you have any thoughts on the way in which movements against patriarchy or gender justice movements more broadly in Brazil, may have had something to say about renewing democracy. No, I just totally agree. <laughs> and uh, totally agree. I think that uh, that's why we need more international, build more international solidarity, as we had, for example, in the 90s with Via Campesina, with the with the social rural social movements and uh, and now and now it seems that post thousands post the economic the recession the economic crisis the social movements they are less international than 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 50 20 years ago during the world social forum for example in which that solidarity international solidarity was uh, was was very strong and i think that uh, what what unites us as when, when we join feminist movements for abortion in Argentina or against the Bolsonaro in Brazil or uh, anything else is, is in the end an anti-capitalist and uh, anti-patriarchy struggle. So totally agree. If I can chime in, so um, I think um, if the question is really about access to leadership, uh, we uh, we actually could fall into the pitfall of tokenism. Um, for example, you know, uh, three women in among eight men and stuff like that. Um, uh, rather, I would say it's um, it's important to. Uh, reflect on the systemic, uh, systemic um, sexism, like what we are doing in the United States now, the systemic racism. So, but unfortunately, this kind of a reflection and also public debates have not been have not been uh, focused on in in many countries. So uh, that's my sort of brief comment on that. Now, the problem is not really just about you know whether they have access to leadership or things like that. It's mainly to change the change change to patriarchal order um in the in the system in the society thanks um and i think that is an ongoing discussion even you know does tokenism sort of open the way for more politicized ways of doing things or right. you know, even if it doesn't lead to a uh, change in order but of course it can often right. just become a, a, a check boxing exercise box checking sorry a box checking exercise <laughs> but yeah i think that that's that's that is that is a conversation to be had um thank you um there is a question and i think that's specifically to ajay about anything that advocates of democracy um might learn from the formation of the farmers protests uh, you mentioned the farmers protest briefly and you mentioned the ways in which uh, you know there were cross caste solidarities and cross religious solidarities that were sort of to be built, but I don't know if you wanted to quickly say more about 
what advocates of democracy might learn from the farmers' protests in India? No, I just saw that question. I think it's uh, interestingly formulated uh, in terms of, I think, the class nature of uh, this protest and, you know, in terms of uh, uh, its equation with democrat uh, democracy. Uh, no, farmers' movement undoubtedly had uh, was a demand a movement led by rich farmers. So, in terms of the old Pranabardhan kind of formulation of three proprietary dominant proprietary classes, it really was one block. And but it could therefore master the support of other sections of the small farmers, the landlords, and the Dalits. So, my own hunch, or my own reading of the movement was that it, it in terms of its social con uh, content. I think and consent it was with the Hindutva, right? But in terms of its economic pressure that Hindutva was building, you know, the far right was building, uh, it had uh, the economic conflict, but social consensus. So I think this, this is what the farmers movement really produced. And therefore, if you look at the electoral trends post farmers movement, uh, much of the Jat rich farmers went back to voting uh, for the BJP. Therefore, I think this, this really throws up that we cannot really formulate questions in that old language of class or in that settled received language. No, these are new kinds of fragments that are emerging in terms of social contents versus economic pressure. How, how do the actors really make a choice on the ground? Uh, I think those are the new types of questions. Also quickly to respond to the previous one on women, I think in India we have had two trends. The farmers movement again gave new space for uh, women in Kap Panchayas, they came as came across as leaders. Second, women are emerging as an independent constituency in electoral politics, that increasingly you see regional parties formulating uh, you know, policies that are very specific for women. And we have had a long uh, lasting demand for 33% reservation for women. So I think this emergence of women as independent constituents cutting across castes and religions, what would it really mean for this larger question of uh, no civic democracy for citizenship and larger uh, uh, cross solidarities. I think is a question that we need to really uh, keep our eyes on. Thanks, Ajay. Um, there is a, a, another question, and I think it's the last question, which is to do with uh, the tendency, including in so-called democratic countries, um, where rights of people are being curtailed, especially minoritized people. Um, and this is, of course, the case not only in uh, you know Eastern Europe or the so-called Global South, but also uh, in England and the rest of the UK. Um, um, any thoughts from the panel in terms of what they see as uh, you know the the curtailment of rights of minorities? I think every one of you has referred to this uh, tendency in your respective contexts. But um, I, I wondered, you know, if you had any further thoughts or anything you wanted to add to what you've said already about the ways in which minority rights are being curtailed and how minoritized groups might be able to reclaim some of those rights. Yeah, I can make a comment about women's rights. Just a very quick comment. I think it is a very important uh, topic to be discussed. And this is one of, uh, one of the examples that we need transnational solidarity and research because especially the impact of religion now in countries like in the US, in Brazil, in the Philippines, in Hungary. So we, have, we are witnessing all these anti-reproductive rights or anti-abortion, this uh, backslide in terms of women's rights. And uh, so this is really important also that we understand that there are organized groups that have been cultivating this idea and planning these destructions of rights at least since the 80s, since the women's conference in Beijing in 1995. And, uh, and we need to understand this structure of power as, as well, and uh, because it's, uh, it's being very effective and especially because they found a window of opportunity at this conservative uh, and fundamentalist movement. They found a window of opportunity along with the, the rise of far right. Uh, but also there are many movements and feminist movements that are resisting and uh, that, uh, yes, so we, we should also look at, for example, the case of Argentina and how they are resisting and uh, these this counterattack of uh, conservative counterattack. 
thanks. If Mr. I might come in, Anjajit. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think uh, no, this is a, a very crucial question in terms of uh, uh, the equation between populism and majoritarianism. You know that on one hand, populism does represent a certain spirit of uh, social democratization. But on the other hand, it is taking this majoritarian proportion in terms of othering. I think this is really the key question that we need to you know, get some handle on. Uh, I think the key point really is to uh, argue how do we retrieve uh, you know, culture uh, without taking that majoritarian turn. I think this is something that has happened across democracies that we have thrown the baby with the bathwater, you know, that uh, that that there is that sensibility, that democratized sensibility, which is not finding an articulation, which perhaps therefore is taking an authoritarian turn. So the question perhaps has to be reframed in, in a different sense. And Indian context, I can argue specifically in the Indian context, that uh, I've argued for long against this entire Islamophobia kind of an argument that the majoritarian rise in Indian context is not based exclusively on toxic anti-Muslim kind of a sentiment. I think much of it, what is being celebrated is a deep sense of belonging through the Hindu identity. I think there's a distinction one needs to make between the cultural belonging as against toxic anti-minorism. Much of our secular progressive left you know, kind of collapses the two. That the moment you start celebrating a sense of belonging, then you necessarily articulate it as a majoritarian turn. I think that's where the di direction is really pushing us to make those nuanced uh, distinctions. Thanks, thanks, Ajay. And uh, you're right. I think there is, you know, one does one could lead to the other or feed into the other, but they are analytically separate uh, uh, items of 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 uh, discourse as well as uh, empirics. I think that's that's a crucial point to to make thank you um any any further sort of thoughts on this um on this question specifically or or anything else yes ben please uh sure uh, so i want to add that um so if, if we look comparatively um you know these trends you know the, the ultra rights and uh, anti immigration anti lgbt anti whatever minority groups is sort of global that occurs in pretty much every country uh, in the United States, you have lots of debates about uh, those things. And also you have people who are, uh, you can actually easily classify them as like a new anarchism and, and things like that. But I would say that there's a difference between democracy and authoritarianism in terms of institutions. Although I have been you know, emphasizing democratic social life, but I want to add is that, you know, a regime, a, a democratic institution still matters a lot to um, sort of protect uh, democratic social life. Under democratic regime, you still have a chance to fight against those counter uh, trends. Um, you know, is, you know, since we have uh, talked about uh, Alexander Sibyl's sphere theory, and one of the key uh, components of his theory is that you always have this sort of a struggle between civil sphere and non-civil sphere. And the institutions, uh, communicative and regulative institutions basically can level the ground for the fight. And then you and people agree on some of the basic assumptions, which he actually, he actually assumes as the cause of liberty. So that was basically the hope of democracy. But under authoritarianism, that kind of struggle is uh, more difficult, uh, more um, depending on, on the regime's reaction, the state's um, uh, the the uh, preference to which part of the sort of a debate, uh, for example, the minority issue in China, the way where people uh, clearly, uh, it became a non-issue, uh, you know, and then now recently people realize it's, it's a big issue as well. So I want to say still institutions matter, although this sounds like something countering my argument, but I want to say it's not really to emphasizing we have grassroots democratic social life and we don't have to uh, think about how democracy as an institution. I would say we need to have a very complete understanding of democracy. One part is the system, the other is the social life. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. I think that's uh, that's a useful reminder, even if you don't have to sort of go the other <laughs> extreme. Mm -hmm. um, okay, um, I, I do realize we've sort of, uh, you know, gone, um, you, you know, well over time. Um, uh, but it's been a fascinating conversation and I'm, uh, you know, really thrilled that we could have it. 
Um, if any of you have any questions for each other or clarifications for each other, now's the time before I you know, begin to formally thank uh, everyone. Okay, I gave you your chance. Thank you all so much. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, thank you to our panelists uh, for uh, joining us from different geographies and time zones and for, uh, as I mentioned, often responding uh, very quickly and at very short notice. Um, we are really very grateful. Um, I'd like to especially thank uh, Melissa Williams, uh, who has uh, really sort of put not just this event together, but the you know six events that have been part of this uh, colloquium. So thank you so much, uh, Melissa. Uh, I'd also like to thank our events team at uh, York, who've uh, sort of done all the background work of putting the registration uh, and the posters. Uh, well, Melissa drew the posters, but putting them up, you know, and sort of sharing them um, as apt. So thanks so much to the events team. Uh, thanks also to our respective departments at Jindal and at York for publicizing the work uh, and the, the events uh, and for generally providing us with support. Uh, we are very grateful. And of course, to all the events um, and the participants of all the events so far, as well as this particular one, uh, thank you so much. And uh, last but not the least, to reiterate our heartfelt thanks to uh, Arzu, Ajay, Hosanna and Bin. Uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, this evening. If I've left anyone else, uh, anyone out, I really apologize, but you you know what I mean. I mean, I'm, we are very grateful. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you. Take good thank care. Thank you very everyone. much. Yeah, and have a great 2023. We'll be in touch with recordings and, and things. We'll let you know when the recordings are up. Uh, Melissa does a really, really, you know, efficient job at it. Uh, and so whenever it's ready, she'll let everyone know. Um, thank you so have great, much. Have a great thank week. You. Thank, you, thank, thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take Bye. care. Take care, everyone.